box as well. Uh, finally, we're recording today's webinar and we'll post the audio and the slides um, following the webinar on the Project PA website. So to get started, um, this project is funded by USDA Team Nutrition Training Grant. Our outline for today, we have several presenters. First, we will have an overview of Smarter Lunchrooms by Kathleen Hiltwine and Jenny Edmondson from PDE. Then I'll talk about what we're doing in Pennsylvania to promote Smarter Lunchrooms and some opportunities that are available to Pennsylvania schools. Then we'll have two food service directors from Pennsylvania who have implemented Smarter Lunchrooms in their own schools and have seen some really nice successes. So we'll have Kelly Price talking about Smarter Lunchrooms in the Leechburg Area School District and then um, Kristen Deli from Upper Dublin School District talking about Smarter Lunchrooms and we'll end with a Q&A. So feel free to submit your questions at any time during today's uh, webinar and we'll collect those and save them until the end. So I'm going to turn the presentation over to PDE. We'll just pull up their slides. And they will be giving an overview of Smarter Lunchrooms. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jenny and Kathleen. Hi, thanks, Elaine. Elaine, I just wanted to tell you, we can't hear you here at PDE, so um, just want to make sure that our other presenters can hear that you've started. We had to listen through our computer. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Kathleen and I are going to start by giving a brief background on the Smarter Lunchrooms Movement, which is a USDA-backed initiative that originated from research conducted at Cornell University Center for Behavioral Economics and Child Nutrition Program, which is also called the Penn Center. Behavioral economics uses the psychology, human behavior, to explain economic make, including decisions we make every day of purchase and eat. School nutrition programs around the country are faced with the challenge of improving the nutrition content of school meals while keeping costs contained and keeping students coming back for more. And ultimately, the goal is for students to learn about what constitutes a healthy meal so that they will grow into adults who make healthy food choices. The Cornell Ben Center refers to the challenges facing school nutrition programs as the school lunch trilemma. This picture offers an example of some unintended nutritional and economic consequences from what was a well-intentioned decision made in a lunchroom. The two men pictured are Brian Wansink and David Just of the Ben Center, and they conducted a study of 11 Oregon elementary schools where chocolate milk was banned from the cafeterias and replaced with unflavored nonfat milk. While this policy eliminated the added sugar in chocolate milk, they found that it also decreased total milk sales by 10%. And even though many students substituted white for chocolate milk, it turns out that they wasted 29% more than before the ban. Nutritionally, students on average consume less sugar and fewer calories, but they also consume less protein and calcium. And the milk ban may have been a factor in a 7% decrease in their lunch participation. So how can we use the principles of behavioral economics to lead students to make healthier choices in the lunchroom while minimizing consequences that we want to avoid? We can use choice architecture, which means offering choices that lead students to make the healthier choice without forcing them. As you'll see, these choices usually mean only making minor adjustments that are often free or very low cost, so a smarter lunchroom can result in a big bang for the buck. One of the things to avoid is reactance. This is where a person rebels against something that they perceive as taking away their freedom to choose, much like the student who says, I just won't buy lunch if I can't get chocolate milk. Instead, when we are given choices, we tend to follow through with that choice and also repeat it in the future. This is known as attribution. We'll look at this again in a moment in a study where students were given the choice between carrots and celery at lunch. So what do we know about the psychology of food decisions? We have two decision-making mechanisms, the deliberative mechanism, or cold state, 
when we're in a cold state, we tend to be rational and logical. We do things like read the nutrition labels, consider price, purchase smaller amounts, and less junk food. The emotional mechanism for a hot state is when we make naive decisions and have knee-jerk reactions. We go for what looks and tastes good and is convenient and fast. We buy and eat more, and we might rationalize our decision by saying, well, just this one time I'll get the supersized meal. I'll be good later. I imagine we've all experienced the difference between going grocery shopping when we're super hungry, which is very much a hot state, versus going to the store after we've eaten a meal and we make more rational cold state decisions. So for kids and teenagers who do not have fully developed rational systems, they're almost in a hot state all of the time. They're often reactive to decisions that adults make them, and they aren't typically thinking about the long-term health consequences of the foods they choose to eat. Fortunately, most kids find some healthy foods to be acceptable and appealing, so we can capitalize on that by making the healthy foods cool and by setting up the cafeteria to subtly nudge them to make the better food choice. This is the idea behind the Smarter Lunchrooms movement, to inexpensively design the cafeteria to encourage healthier choices that avoid reactants in kids and instead encourage future healthy choices. I mentioned a moment ago about using the psychology of attribution. Attribution is powerful because in our minds, when we select something, we subconsciously tend to feel that because it was my choice, I'll repeat that decision in the future. An example is giving students the choice between carrots or celery in the lunch line, rather than offering no choice and simply placing the carrots on their tray. We know that kids are prone to reactants, so they might feel that since they didn't pick those carrots, they aren't going to eat those carrots and those unwanted carrots may wind up in the trash. Instead, in a study by the Ben Center, where students were allowed to choose between carrots and celery, they found that just by giving them a choice, they ate 91% of the vegetable they selected versus only 69% when carrots were the only item offered. And this was the result, even though the vast majority of kids, 90%, chose the carrots anyway. Rather than banning flavored milk entirely, which might have the unintended consequence of lowering milk sales, another option is simply to rearrange the milk coolers to make it more convenient for students to reach in and take the milk. Here's how you can do that. Make sure that white milk accounts for at least a third of all the drinks displayed in the cooler and place the white milk in front of the other drinks so that students have to reach around the white milk to get something else. Also, place white milk first in line before any other drinks so that students have to walk past the white milk first. Some additional Smarter Lunchroom ideas are to increase variety among more healthy a la carte items and decrease variety among less healthy items. For example, one study found that the number of students consuming healthy items increased by 35% after the introduction of a healthy choices only convenience line in the lunchroom. Integrating more whole grain options over the past couple of years has happened by design with the changes in the meal pattern and smart snacks, and probably most of you achieve success by phasing in these items over time. The Ben Center similarly recommends that you make changes to the lunchroom incrementally, maybe a couple at a time, for better acceptance among students. A great tip is to take advantage of summer break or long holiday weekends during the school year to make some of your smarter lunchroom changes. Kathleen's now going to take over and talk about the six principles in Smarter Lunchroom. The Ben Center has condensed their research on behavioral economics into six easy to implement strategies for schools to use in customizing their own Smarter Lunchroom makeover. These strategies will help you encourage your students to make smarter, healthier choices in the lunchroom. So let's take a quick look at each of those principles. Managing portion sizes. Use smaller containers, plates, and serving utensils for foods that you wish to limit. This is important because people tend to clear their plates, so if they are given too much, they will eat too much. When you serve students unlimited amounts of items, such as condiments, treats, and chips, they will likely serve themselves too much. Instead of serving from a larger bowl, using a larger utensil, opt for a smaller bowl with a smaller utensil. Increasing the convenience of healthy foods. 
The Ben Center has found that a lot of the choices that we make aren't necessarily because the items are our favorite or because they taste good, but rather we pick them because they're just there. If there is a tin of candy sitting on your desk, you are likely to finish the candy sooner than if that bowl was walking distance away. If it's less convenient and less easily accessible, you are less likely to snack as often as if it were within arm's reach. Incorporate these principles or this principle into your lunchroom. So instead of putting less healthy foods such as cookies and chips at the very beginning of the serving line, give healthier options that advantage. Try making the healthier foods more easily accessible by making changes such as putting your milk at the beginning of the line or at the front of the computer or the front of the cooler instead of the more sugary beverages. Another option is moving your salad bar so that the students don't have to leave the regular serving line to get vegetables or by serving fruit pre-sliced and or peeled so that the students aren't turned off by the time it will take to make a piece of fruit, such as an orange, ready to eat. The third principle is improving visibility. When we see a good looking food in person or on a menu, we crave it even if we intend on buying something else or weren't even hungry at all. How often do you eat out and intend on eating a salad or a smaller portion size entree? but instead end up opting for something less healthy um, in a larger portion. Work on improving the eye appeal of healthy items in your lunchroom. The Ben Center suggests taking your vegetables out from behind the sneeze guards and out of the shaving pans and serving them in small, container sizes, small containers placed right in the front where they're easy to see and easy to grab. Try serving fruits and vegetables in a decorative serving bowl or tray and place it right next to the cashier where a student has the option of grabbing one for a reimbursable meal or just because they look good. Do you have a salad bar? Take a look at where it's located. Having your salad bar more visible and more easily accessible to students, as you'll see in the next slide, has the potential for significantly increasing salad sales. So as you'll see here, students enter the room right where the black dotted line is in the upper right hand corner and walk straight ahead toward the hot lunch line. After leaving the lunch line, they walk directly to the cash registers. Because of where the location of the salad bar used to be, and because the hot lunch line was in direct sight of the students as they walked into the lunchroom, the salad bar was infrequently visited. The Ben Center found that by making the salad bar more centralized and placing it in a location where the students were literally standing next to it while waiting to pay, nearly tripled their sale of salads. Enhancing taste expectations is the fifth principle. The, the more we expect a food to taste good, the better it will taste. Get the students excited by providing descriptive and creative names for your healthier menu items to get their imaginations going. So instead of calling carrots, carrots, try something like x-ray vision carrots. Instead of cucumbers, try cool crisp cucumbers. Try serving well-packaged salads in clean individual containers instead of shaping pans. Um, this way they look nice, they look clean, and uh, that leads the students to anticipate a more positive eating experience. Suggestive selling. Talk up your foods and students will be more likely to try them. Um, some fun, easy interventions would include verbal prompts. Uh, talk to your staff about verbally prompting students. So they might ask, would you like some salad with your pizza? Or try today's special, it's delicious. Um, that enthusiasm is important. You can have staff ask which vegetable they would like instead of saying take a vegetable um, because you know children appreciate having that choice. Take advantage of well-known figures in your community or perhaps some high school athletes that students may look up to uh, to promote certain healthy menu items. An option is utilizing signage, um, posting bright, easy to read signs that advertise a special of the day, perhaps, or other healthy menu items that you're interested in promoting. And last but not least, set smart pricing strategies. How often have you purchased a not so great option because it's cheap or on sale? Students find themselves in the same dilemma in the lunchroom. Instead of purchasing a reimbursable meal, they may buy two a la carte items, such as a bag of chips and juice, as their meal in an attempt to save money. Bundled items often result in the consumption of unnecessary, unnecessary calories and less healthy options. So instead of bundling less healthy items, try bundling a healthy item with a less 
healthy item or two healthy items. And always show students what a great value of reimbursed full meal is. Make sure they know how many fruits and vegetables they are allowed to take. This gives them the option to fill up on healthier items. This here is the Smarter Lunchroom Self-Assessment Scorecard. This tool, uh, developed by the Ben Center and available on their website, can help you evaluate your lunchroom. It can help you congratulate you, yourself for things that you are doing well and then identify areas of opportunity for improvement. You are able to do this yourself, but for those who are interested, one of our cadre members can assess your lunchroom using this scorecard for you. And as you all know, Smarter Lunchrooms is popping up all over within the school nutrition programs. Some more reasons to consider implementing Smarter Lunchroom strategies are that it is now part of the Healthier U.S. School Challenge application process. It's mentioned in the proposed rule on the local school wellness policy as a recommended source for information on employing evidence-based strategies that promote the consumption of healthy foods. And the Smarter Lunchrooms movement is included in USDA's list of acceptable training topics for the purposes of professional standards. So uh, trainings completed that pertain to Smarter Lunchroom can contribute towards your annual training requirements. State agencies also have the option to use team nutrition funds to facilitate the implementation of Smarter Lunchroom strategies within SFAs in the state. And this is an opportunity that Pennsylvania has taken advantage of and, and something Elaine will talk more about shortly. We're now going to take a minute to talk about the Healthier U.S. School Challenge. Um, it is referred to as the Healthier U.S. School Challenge Smarter Lunchrooms, um, more easily referred to as HUSSC. It is a nationwide voluntary certification initiative created by the USDA that recognizes those schools enrolled in team nutrition that have created healthier school environments through the promotion of nutrition and physical activity. The initiative recognizes excellence at four different levels. Those levels are bronze, silver, gold, and gold award of distinction. In August of 2014, HUSSC was relaunched to incorporate smarter lunchrooms. Depending on which award level a school is interested in applying for, they are required to implement a specified number of smarter lunchroom scorecard action items. By implementing these items, you become one step closer to completing the HUSSC application, which could eventually give you the chance to receive recognition for your school food service operation and overall healthy school environment, and the chance to receive between $500 and $2,000 depending on the award level. You may even find that your school is already implementing a lot of the action items found on the Smarter Lunchroom Scorecard. So last spring, we here at PDE presented a webinar overviewing this application process, and you can find this recording on Project PA's website, and the link is provided on the slide. As I mentioned, only schools enrolled in Team Nutrition may apply for this, so if you aren't already a Team Nutrition school, we encourage you to enroll. You can head to the link above or on the slide. You can click on the School Enrollment Form, read over and complete the form, and submit it per the instructions that are provided. Um, being a team nutrition school gives you access to numerous resources and tons of free materials, um, and it is a requirement for the HUSSC application. And that concludes my part of the presentation. I will now continue with an overview of what's available in Pennsylvania in terms of Smarter Lunchrooms and how we're trying to spread Smarter Lunchrooms throughout Pennsylvania. Part of this will be a review of a webinar that we conducted last spring at just about this time. So I'm going to kind of reintroduce uh, an opportunity that we introduced about a year ago and then tell you a little bit more about a, a newer opportunity to promote Smarter Lunchrooms in your schools. So we have an opportunity available for you to have smart, a Smarter Lunchrooms assessment done as well as some feedback and support for those Smarter Lunchrooms changes. And our strategy to do that is we have recruited and trained what we are calling the Pennsylvania Smarter Lunchrooms cadre. So this is a group of seven retired or former school food service directors who have participated in a two-part training 
A part one consisted of an in-person training uh, here at State College conducted by a representative of Cornell's Ben Center. And then each of them as well went out with a representative from the Ben Center to see an assessment done in a pilot school district in Pennsylvania. So they are now available to all of you to conduct Smarter Lunchrooms assessments in your schools. And this is a free service. It's free of charge to schools. And I'll just tell you a little bit about how this works. So if you decide you would like to have an assessment done, we would um, connect you with a Smarter Lunchrooms cadre member. They would conduct an initial site visit in your school around the lunchtime, probably arriving a little bit before lunch, and they would complete the Smarter Lunchrooms scorecard that uh, Kathleen mentioned. Following that, they would then do a debriefing with you, telling you where your positive points were and where you might have some opportunities to make some changes. And as was mentioned, most of these Smarter Lunchrooms changes are really low cost or no cost changes, some of which you can make quickly. Then there will be some follow-up communication with you by the cadre member and finally a follow-up site visit after you have made some of the recommended changes. So if this is something that you would like to take an advantage of, it's a fairly easy process. On our Project PA website, we have an online application that's pretty short and straightforward. When we receive your application, we will connect you with the cadre member that is closest to your school district. Then you would decide what school you want to have the assessment done in. You would host the cadre member on a date and time that's agreed upon between both of you. And then implement some of the agreed upon changes. Now, the cadre member may find 10, 12 different types of changes that you can make. We don't expect that you're going to necessarily make all of the changes. You might want to look at which two or three uh, you really feel that you can make and that correspond to your objectives for having the Smarter Lunchrooms assessment done. Then we would like you to document your results. And what I mean by this is, for instance, thinking about what was your objective in having a Smarter Lunchrooms assessment done in the first place. Were you hoping to maybe increase your participation in school lunch? Were you hoping to uh, increase the sale of fruits and vegetables or white milk? If so, we would like you to tell us what happened. Did the Smarter Lunchrooms changes result in the change that you were looking for? So for instance, did your participation change? Did your sales of those targeted items change? And then finally, we ask that you submit a promising practice to us. And if you get to this point, this point, we'll provide more details about how you would do that. But it's just a simple form that you submit through our website describing what you did, what changes you made, and what the results were. We have another opportunity that we uh, introduced more recently, just about at the beginning of the year, and this is through some team nutrition funds. We now have available Smarter Lunchrooms mini, Smarter Lunchrooms mini grants um, of up to $1,200. So these are some funds that you can use to make the recommended changes. Some examples of things that you can use um, the funds for are signage uh, in your cafeteria and lunchroom, uh, menu boards to display what menus you're offering that day, posters to increase improve the atmosphere in the eating area, attractive containers for displaying fruits and vegetables, and costs related to a student advisory council. So for example, maybe you want to bring together some students who can help you with naming of your fruits and vegetables. Or maybe you want to do some taste testing with students um, for particular items. So if you're interested in a Smarter Lunchrooms mini grant, the requirements are you, you want, must be a sponsor of the National School Lunch Program. You must be a team nutrition school. And on uh, that last slide that Kathleen discussed, she provided the link to sign up to be a team nutrition school. It's a fairly easy process. You must be a self-operating school food service program. And you must have a Smarter Lunchrooms assessment completed by a cadre member. So the way that this works, and there's more details about this on the Project PA website, is you would first apply to have an assessment completed in your school district. When you apply to have the assessment completed, we will connect you to a cadre member. So I will send you an email saying that so-and-so has agreed to conduct your assessment. And I'll attach a copy of the mini-grant application. And I'll tell you that once your assessment is complete, assuming you meet these other criteria, you are then eligible to apply for a Smarter Lunchrooms mini-grant. And there's our Project PA website. And if you have any other questions, again, you can uh, write them in the chat box. Or if you have questions following the webinar, my contact information is on this slide. Um, I just want to say one thing about this assessments. Um, 
well, actually a couple of things about the assessments. I know that all of you can probably take that Smarter Lunchroom scorecard and do an assessment in your own cafeterias um, and lunchrooms, but sometimes it just helps to have a second set of eyes. Sometimes it's if it's something that you're seeing day in and day out, there might be things that you might not even recognize, and just bringing in a second set of eyes can be helpful with that. Also, I want to stress that this is not a, re a review of your cafeteria or your practices or your menu. This is not an audit. The cadre members are not looking to find whether or not you're doing things right. They're not looking to see if your menus are in compliance with uh, nutrition standards and meal patterns. They're really looking more at your cafeteria environment and the atmosphere in your lunchrooms and coming up with some low cost or no cost changes that you can make to improve that environment. And so that leads us, I think, nicely into our next presenter, which is Kelly Price from Leechburg School District. Kelly had a Smarter Lunchrooms assessment done in her school, and she also has been awarded a mini-grant to make some changes, and she has seen some really nice successes. So I'm going to turn it over to Kelly to talk about a Smarter Lunchrooms grant success story. Kelly? Thanks, Elaine. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Kelly Price. I am the Food Service Director for Leechburg Area School District, and uh, we were one of the grant recipients for the Smarter Lunchroom. And as Elaine um, had just previously stated, I think summed it up really well that um, it's def they're not there to um, you criticize what you're doing or to audit you know, and look at your menus and things like that. They're just there to help um, improve things or take a second look at things. And um, definitely made me realize having a second set of eyes um, some things that we definitely, like she said, could uh, fix at low cost or no cost um, changes. So um, today I just have some before and after pictures and a little bit about um, our district. Our enrollment um, is district-wide is 842 uh, kids, and our average daily participation right now is about 505. Um, I would say before the Smarter Lunchroom um, observation that we had, it was probably about in the four. 90s, so we're slowly seeing a climb um, even daily now. I think today I did the count, it was about 515. So um, depending on the menu item and the days coming, it seems to continue to be helping us. Um, we're considered a campus, meaning everyone from pre-K to 12th grade eats in one cafeteria during different lunch periods. Um, so we have them separated by grade, and they, we have three separate lunches that come through our lines. Um, some of the objectives that we set with the Smarter Lunch Room um, Grant was one to increase student participation by three to five percent. Objective two was to increase consumption of fruits and vegetables and white milk uh, by creating a more inviting serving um, line and eating area. Also to offer fruits in two areas of our serving lines when before we only were offering it in one. Um, and our objective three was to create a more inviting serving and eating area, um, having more creative and descriptive names in the serving lines as well as being out in the hallways that were leading up to the serving areas. Um, to rotate our posters throughout the year and to label items on our service line with either creative names or just to have them labeled in general. So our objective one results, um, our student participation continues to increase some days, um, especially on something like um, popcorn chicken bowl day. It can be as high as 550 meals a day. Um, the kids really reacted well to the changes that we made um, in a very positive way. I was very surprised even on the first day when the kids came through um, just their positive comments of, wow, this looks so nice, and did you get new baskets? I really like them. These containers make things easier to see or to reach. Um, they really did kind of pick out exactly what we did, so that was really exciting. Um, our objective two results was we made signs for our utensil carts. Um, we also, as part of our signage, we had a huge issue with kids trying to look through the cups until they found what they wanted, and then um, that caused a lot of the forks and spoons to be wasted on the floor. So by having them labeled, even the, um, funny, even the older kids um, liked it better, even with, as younger kids did as well. And we added some colorful pieces of fabric to brighten up the vegetables being served. We ended up going to a fabric store and just getting um, fabric that would match the fruits or vegetables that we were serving. So the one in the picture is just of carrots. So we had them folded and placed over the baskets just to add a little bit more color to the lunch line. Um, objective three, we also purchased one of the One Great Tray posters and the hanging signs. And um, we had uh, found the hanging signs from a previous director and repurposed them and had them hung above our lunch line um, just to help the kids see and just have some better signage. 
So our before pictures, um, as you can see, that was our serving line where we had our fruits mostly was on the um, sheet pans as well as some of just the pink or green kind of plain trays. And then our after photos might be out of order here for one second. Um, the after photo. I'll actually come back to that in just one second. Um, the before and after pictures of our cafeteria were just kind of plain. We had incorporated some things during March that um, had a sign about catching a rainbow, and we had a guest leprechaun that came out to help um, have a rainbow of fruits and vegetables. We had the art department paint a mural on our cafeteria wall, um, just something that would help to decorate some of the plain walls that we had in our cafeteria. So I think maybe... There's our after photo of the baskets that we had purchased. So on the bottom, we had the larger baskets, which are actually the same size as a standard sheet tray. And then the two skinnier ones in the inside um, held things like apples or prepackaged items very nicely. So those baskets are actually from Hubert, and they are machine washable. Um, the entire basket can go through the dishwasher. And they have liners in the inside that were plastic um, that we end up hand washing just for fear that they might get too hot and melted in the dishwasher, but um, helps to line the baskets really nicely too so you can place the fruit directly into the baskets and then just remove the liners at the end of the day to wash them. So um, the kids said for them being lower, it was easier to reach things and um, really seemed to enjoy the look of the baskets. Um, our before and afters on our salad bar, we had won the salad bar grant last year as well. It was just kind of plain, and then after the Smarter Lunchrooms came, we just... Um, we're able to decorate it a little more and add some extra signs um, to help the kids and label, um, extra labels for the dressing and items um, to help facilitate faster movement through the salad bar. Uh, before our cafeteria, um, like I said, had plain walls um, and we had the art department also make some paper items. As you can see, the butterflies or the second grade mural was also hung on the, on the uh, wall. And not only did it add color, but the kids kind of have ownership of it as they come through and they point out that they made that and it seems to get them very excited during school lunch. Again, that's a picture of the mural that the older kids did for the art department. And then we had some posters that were outdated. I didn't have any before pictures of the posters, but they were still um, pretty outdated, kind of in the My Pyramid um, type posters. So we tried to find some more that were a little more colorful and fun. Um, one of the kids' favorite ones is um, Keep Your Selfie Healthy. And we found these on Mission Nutrition and purchased those in sets to hang in the posters along the lunch line. And then our second half of our grant is to be continued. Um, we are currently in the process of submitting our promising practice portion of the grant to uh, receive the second half. And we're looking to implement some of the following with that money. Um, we think maybe getting a floor stand to have um, on either side of the line for the kids to read the menu as they come in would help. Uh, we are looking to get some more baskets for the top um, half of our service line and as well as some of the clip signage um, that we can add some colorful tags and things that we can have that we can just reuse. Um, we did uh, look at purchasing the three stack basket. We had gotten one for one side. We just need to purchase the other side. And inside that basket, we were using things like dried fruit. Um, the craisins fit really nicely in there. Raisin boxes fit nicely in there. Uh, we even used the low-fat caramel dip with the apple slices for dipping days um, fit nicely in those baskets as well. And the clips do really well clipping onto the, the baskets. So um, still in progress, we want to change the milk so it's in front of the flavored milk. Um, the students will uh, choose that over the flavored. Um, we did try to rotate it, but we were having um, a little bit of difficulty estimating how much and for need our, our actual milk cooler um, doesn't hold that much in the front section as it does um, across, so we were just trying to figure out a new way for that to happen. Um, we also developed a student survey that we're going to be passing out during the student advisory council meetings, and those meet um, once a month at the three different grade levels, so we'll be working with them. And we're also going to be giving inventive names um, to the targeted fruits and vegetables, um, as well as getting the signs as soon as our signs come in to be able to make those signs and have them posted for the kids. And I think that is it. Overall, we saw about a 73% increase in um, fruit of the kids that took it um, after we put them in different baskets. Um, the kids said that, you know, it looked nicer, it looked fresher. Um, they said it looked more colorful. And um, also a 55% increase to the veggies before our kids were really big on the romaine salads and the baby carrots but weren't taking as much as of the veggie trays um, that we had um, presented. We also had done a broccoli salad and a um, green pea salad, and they seem to 
um, seem to grab those more on the new easily accessible baskets. I think those are pretty much all of our results. If anybody has any questions at the end, I think we'll be available for questions. Okay, thank you very much, Kelly. That was great. And yes, if anyone has questions, you can just submit them in the chat box and we will address those following our last presentation, which is Kristen Deli from Upper Dublin School District. Perfect. Uh, hi there, everybody. It's Kristen Deli. I'm the Director of Food Services for the Upper Dublin School District. And my presentation is regarding some uh, small changes that I made uh, when I came over to this school district after being at a previous school district um, that had an assessment and the tools that I learned from the cadre member uh, to do the self-assessment. Uh, so currently, my school district has about six schools and, and kitchen, uh, excuse me, and kitchens and has about 4,500 students enrolled. So I have four elementary schools and one middle school plus a high school. Again, I had previously participated in a Smarter Lunchroom site visit with a cadre member, but no official visit has been done at um, this school district. So when I came to this district, I realized that um, I had a lot of uh, areas of need. And some of the areas where I had a really increased amount of waste when I offered skim or 1% milk, so much so that a lot of my staff did not want to order skim or 1% milk. We had a lot of waste of fresh and canned fruit, so I could go through um, a box of apple, I'm sorry, a box of oranges, uh, maybe one every two weeks. So a lot of those oranges would end up going bad. At the elementary school, I had a really uh, long lunch line uh, at the cash register, and a lot of that was due to having to really prompt the kids to go back and take a fruit or a veggie. Of course, when that happens, we did have some threat of not getting uh, the reimbursement because the meals were not complete. And then overall, there was some lack of participation, especially when the prompting for the fruit and veggie uh, was made. And so we really did have to come up with a game plan. And after ha having already participated in the assessment, I knew that it was important to really start small. And I also had to get my managers and staff on board. This was one of the major, major elements to success in the kitchens um, where we made some changes. I really sat down, spoke with my managers about behavioral economics and the Smarter Lunchrooms movement. And then from there, we approached the kitchen staff. Hindsight, one of the areas that I think I should have um, gone back and um, done was talk to the cafeteria aides as well. Um, some of the opposition that I got came from the cafeteria aides because they were kind of um, helping the children come along through the lines and um, they should have been involved in the decision too so that they could have understand the, the concepts that we were trying to achieve. So what I had my staff do was complete a scorecard. I completed a scorecard and then we worked together to come up with ideas and goals and objectives for um, our game plan. The actual Smarter Lunchroom self-assessment is really, really easy to follow. And so you'll see here's, actu here's one of my assessments. And my, my recommendation, I think this is the recommendation of the Smarter Lunchroom movement as well, is to do the assessment at least once a year. Because this was a new district to me, I just started in August, I did it twice because I wanted to see where I was at in the beginning, and then we've done one at the end of the year, too. And what I did is I checked off all of the areas that were completed or existing, and then I circled any area that was an actual opportunity. Some of the items on the Smarter Lunchroom self-assessment, they are just not possible. For example, in my district, we could not become community eligible. So that option was out of, out of our, our range, so we just focused on things that we really could change. So let me give you the example of my middle school. The environment of the middle school was at, and it was very, very much like the presentation and the setup that PDE showed us earlier. When the students were um, allowed to come into the cafeteria, 
they passed the fruit and veggie bar to get to their trays, and so they would never come back around. They grabbed their trays and went right to hot food because the fruit and veggie bar was behind, behind them. The cafeteria aides actually stood in front of the fruit and veggie bar, and essentially they blocked it off from the students. And again, in essence, what they were doing was they were leading the students to the entree and a la carte selection by blocking off that fruit and veggie bar. And before, the staff only kept one line of white milk in the back of the cooler because the children didn't want white milk. Uh, and I did talk about how the oranges would go bad regularly. So we did some changes, and after looking at our self-assessment tool, we decided to focus on a couple of items, even though we had plenty to do. We focused on those fruits, veggies, and the milk. So the first thing that we did was we moved the trays to the fruit and vegetable cart. So this was the first stop for all children coming into the cafeteria. Other changes that we made were we decided to kind of split things up and make them a little bit more colorful. This was a very, very simple solution. It cost no money, and it, and it was no extra effort. Here are some of our displays um, just for our bag, our bag um, and very, very convenient um, fruit and veggies. Another little change is we asked the staff to encourage the students to head to the cart first. So as our cafeteria aides were guiding the children into the cafeteria, we encouraged them, hey, guys, remember, go pick up your, your tray, grab a fruit or a veggie. And then we started putting fruits and vegetables at the register, and we, we got some baskets from a vendor uh, free of charge, uh, three-tier baskets. Another amazing thing was we started cutting the oranges. And this was a trick that I learned from the cadre member. Before, I think the, the thinking was, you know, if you want an orange, you're going to take an orange. But as soon as we started cutting those orange, the first day, we sold out of oranges. And this was such an important part of our transition because it instantaneously showed our staff that, that they could make real changes. And they were just blown away. And that was really, really helpful. Uh, now, so we put the um, white milk in front of the chocolate milk, and as you can see, we do that um, at least two-thirds of our milk offered is white. Uh, just a little trick of the trade here. We have our, our student helpers um, come in to our, to our cafeterias to help um, set up and stock in the beginning of the day. And so these are upperclassmen who are learning life skills. And so one of the things that we did was we took p pictures and we had conversations with their instructors about our new goals for the setup. So there were guidances for the, new, the students who are helping, and we got a little bit more compliance out of them that way for sure. As a result, our participation at San Diego Middle School has increased by 10%. Uh, to date, over this year, we've increased our fruit and vegetable intake by 30%. I haven't taken a time study per se, but I can say that I do believe that the line times have absolutely decreased, especially with those fruit and vegetables at the register. The, one of the craziest and just the best things that has happened out of doing the self-assessment is we have not wasted one cart of milk since we started doing this. We would easily have to throw out 40 cartons of milk a week before. We do get a lot of compliments on the differences in the cafeteria, and I think that the staff are more positive about the time that it takes to prepare the food and the setup. They, they feel like the work that they're doing is paying off and there's a reward. And to be honest, there were really no increases to our labor. We just simply rearranged how we did things. Uh, if anything, it became a little bit more efficient. Uh, there's continued opportunities with the self-assessment. Um, and we know that this is work in progress and small changes you know, make big results. One of the things that we're doing in our kitchens next year to help uh, with the with the staff and continuing the Smarter Lunch Rooms movement is we're, in, we're incentivizing implementations. So we are, I'm going to incentivize um, as many implementations as they can make. We're going we're gonna to give them um, some hours. We're going to give them lunches and just show them that their effort is really appreciated. 
Of course, we do use a scorecard um, to plan for the following year because those are what set, sets up our goals. This cost me no time and no money because the scorecard was already ready for us. And then another perk is we get to use the Smarter Lunchroom training to support the efforts that we are making in our kitchens. Once again, I really do feel that little by little, you can make really a lot of progress doing very, very simple, simple, um, simple things. So good luck with everyone's Smarter Lunchroom movement. Okay, now we have time for questions. I don't see that anyone has entered a question in the chat box, but we'll give you a couple uh, minutes or so if you have any questions you want to send to us. In the meantime, uh, thanks again, Kristen and Kelly, and I just wanted to reiterate something that um, Kristen just touched upon regarding the Smarter Lunchroom scorecard. It's a 100-item scorecard, there are, so there are 100 different things that uh, are looking, they're looking at in the cafeteria. We found, especially in our pilot schools, they're really anxious to know what their score is, and they want their score, obviously, to be as high as possible. Um, the Ben Center has told us repeatedly that the scorecard was set up so that it is impossible to get 100, as Kristen mentioned. So there are certain things that you just... Um, because of overlap and different factors, you cannot get 100 on the scorecard. So the idea is just to take a look at where are the opportunities to make improvements. And I really like um, what Kristen said about kind of doing it at the beginning of the school year and then doing it again at the end and seeing where those changes have been made. I would really encourage you, if you think this is something you might be interested in, to go ahead and apply for a Smarter Lunchrooms assessment on our website. This is something that has really taken off when we introduced the cadre last school year and then throughout, or the end of last school year and then throughout this school year. We've gotten quite a lot of requests for assessments and I really want to recognize the great work that our Smarter Lunchrooms cadre has done. They have gone above and beyond the call of duty. They have each done more assessments than we originally asked them to do because of the response that we got. So you might be thinking that your school year is now winding down and it might not be the greatest time to have an assessment done, but I would still encourage you to go ahead and apply if that's something that you think you might want to do and we'll talk to you and a cadre member about whether or not it's possible to have that done before the end of this school year or if it's something that you want to put off until next school year. So this is something that will be available into next school year. The mini grants as well are available through next school year. So I don't see that we have any questions. Again, I want to remind you that the webinar will be posted um, along with the slides from today's webinar on our website. And if you haven't found it already, we have the Smarter Lunchroom certificate available in the file share box for you to download so that you have documentation of your um, credits for this webinar. So I want to thank PDE and I want to thank Kelly and Kristen for wonderful presentations. And thank you all for joining us and have a great end to your school year.